Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Dory Kenyon, a ruling elder at Wallace Presbyterian Church. This is the um, Psalms Sunday School course. We're on lesson 11. This is our second to last lesson in this course. And our focus today is a little bit more of a historical overview about the Psalms in corporate worship. Before we begin, let, let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this special book of the Bible and the role that it has played in the history of the worship of your people throughout the millennia. Um, help us to uh, gain an appreciation for that and even up to our day in our own uh, worship service. Um, just thank you most of all for revealing yourself in your word and above all in your son, our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ. We ask Lord that our hearts might be warm to worship of you even as we prepare for Sunday morning worship this day. We ask these things in Jesus name, amen. Okay, so our goal today is um, just a quick review of where we've been, looking at Psalms as a little Bible. But why, why do we use Psalms in corporate worship? And then some of the beginnings of that use from the biblical perspective, and then a very, 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 very brief history of Psalms in corporate worship, um, including how we use Psalms in worship at Wallace today. Then a review and assignment. So again, uh, to receive weekly class materials and the handout, uh, please send me a, an email at Kenyon at wallacepca.org to get on a class list. And again, what we've been trying to cover are special characteristics of this marvelous book of Psalms, and especially looking at how they reflect the entire biblical narrative of the redemptive history. Um, my goal is for you to think about using your use, using psalms in personal worship, and that will be the main theme for next week. And then also to understand how to um, apply psalms in our personal walk of faith. All scripture is from the um, ESV, unless otherwise noted. So where we've been, <clears throat> um, the majority of this course has been looking at um, verifying what Luther, Martin Luther said that the Psalms is the little Bible and whether the way that many people organize the large um, picture of the one biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation about the history of re Revelation in terms of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, how those are echoed in the Psalms. So we went through creation, uh, the fall, we spent five weeks looking at psalms that reflected different parts of that biblical narrative on the um, history of redemption, including um, the messianic psalms that foretold of Christ. And then we looked at this side of the cross, um, restoration, the already, the blessings we have in Christ, in this life, and then restoration, what our hearts long for that's yet to come, particularly as revealed in the book of uh, Revelation, and how all these things are reflected in, the, uh, in, in amazing ways, in my opinion, in the book of Psalms. But <clears throat> as we think about Psalms being used in corporate worship, um, just very briefly, you know, why are they used in corporate worship? And if you think about all the rules and regulations for sacrifices and the, for the feast days and the holidays, um, it's not clear that God commanded that um, his people sing to him. But we see that throughout <clears throat> scripture, God's people are definitely exhorted again and again to sing to the Lord. We see that in a marvelous way um, in Exodus 1521, after the people crossed safely through the Red Sea, Miriam, Moses' sister, sang to them, 
Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So he was in, she was encouraging the congregation to sing to the Lord. Then we'll look at this more closely, but in 1 Chronicles 16, 8 through 9, the um, maybe illustrative psalm that is given in 1 Chronicles also exports um, God's people. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. <clears throat> Call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. And over and over again um, in the book of Psalms, and I chose at this point Psalm 96, which is also um, in 1 Chronicles 16, so, uh, verses 1 and 2. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. And in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Paul, in these verses from Ephesians, uh, also encourages us to use uh, psalms and hymns. He writes, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness to your God. We see in all of these examples just how singing and the emotions are kind of uh, entwined, especially the praise and thanksgiving. Also, throughout scripture, we see examples of God's people singing to the Lord. Again, <clears throat> in Exodus 15, that chapter begins, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. Wow, the Lord is my strength and the song. What does it mean for the Lord to be my song? Again, this emotional rejoicing and giving back thanksgiving to God. Again, Exodus 15, then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang to them again, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. We also see in the New Testament, Jesus and his followers at the Last Supper, at the conclusion of that, Matthew 26, 30 tells us, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So singing to God was a part of Jesus and the disciples' life. That they sung a hymn was most likely the, um, the Psalms that formed a part of the Passover celebration, the Passover Seder at that time. Those were known as a collection of Psalms within the book of Psalms. Uh, 113, 118, or the Hallel songs, which mostly begin with or end with hallelujah, Hallel being to praise the verb in Hebrew. Also, we see the example of Paul and Silas in prison. And remember, these are only two people apparently singing together. In Acts 16, 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. So Paul and Silas had a collection of hymns that they knew and could sing uh, because this was part of the worship that they had been brought up in. They, 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 they owned these songs and they could sing them while they were in prison. They didn't even have to be in a worship service. Also, this is a very interesting work. Uh, <clears throat> passage. Zephaniah, one of the last prophets in the Old Testament uh, revelation, um, it even implies that God sings over his people. 
And in the context of our study, especially last week's lesson when we were talking about the already not yet, I'd like to read this whole passage because it echoes with the Psalms we were singing, uh, studying last week and that vision of the final days uh, when the final judgment and God is clearly um, together with his, his people and all, everything is completely restored, the consummation, some people call it. This is Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. What an amazing idea in verse 17. God himself, the Lord, Yahweh will exult over you with loud singing. This is kind of that vision. And when I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about um, looking at the passages in Revelation last week, and how it's described as the marriage feast, the marriage feast of the Lamb, what wedding feast is there without singing, without the joy, without the music? And as we know, we are invited our sins are forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ. That song for us as believers has begun. Now, there we can truly rejoice in the victory um, in verse 15. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. Jesus bore our sins in the cross. Therefore, we can sing. But it's not yet complete. Anyway, I just wanted to share. That's another reason why uh, singing is part of worship. So, <clears throat> how did it become part of worship? In First Chronicles, um, chapter 16, it talks uh, about, in, in, in greater depth than in um, the record of this in, in Samuel, when the ark was brought up to Jerusalem, there's a lot of joy, and the ark was put into um, the, tent for, the tent for worship there. So we recall David wanted to build the physical temple. Um, God did not allow that, his son Solomon did. Nevertheless, David, King David, a man <clears throat> after God's own heart who just worshiped um, the Lord continually, he set up worship for the people. And it's described this way. And they brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered the bird offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offerings, the bird, offering the bird offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. Again, the Ark of the Covenant was the physical symbol of God's presence with his people. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, David had wanted to build a physical temple, but he wasn't allowed to. These offerings and sacrifices go back to the time of Moses and the worship in the tabernacle where the people were in the wilderness. Um, and it's very interesting that David himself blessed the people he was not a Levite, he was not a priest, and yet he was acting as a priestly king 
um, foreshadowing Jesus, who is our prophet, priest, and king. And perhaps, uh, you know, he used the Aaronic blessing going way, way back. And again, it occurred to me, his distributing food to the people, um, and not just the Levites who normally had a portion in the sacrifices at the temple, um, you know, remind me of a couple things, but Jesus distributing food to the people, and of course, uh, the communion um, distribution. In First Chronicles, it continues, then he, King David, appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the Ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, to praise Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were Zechariah, Yael, Shem, Shemir Aroth, Yehel, Matihiah, Eliab, Beniah, Obededom, and Yael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Beniah and Yahaziel, the priests, were to blow trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. Then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. So in the Psalter, as we have it now, there are many Psalms, though certainly not all, that invoke, thank, and praise the Lord. I think we've talked about it. The majority of Psalms actually are Psalms of, of lament, but it seemed that um, this worship was to be psalms and songs of praise. Um, also, Asaph the chief, there's 12 psalms ascribed in the Psalter to Asaph, 50, and then a whole collection of his from 73 to 83. We note that instruments were to be played as well, and that Thanksgiving was to be sung. <clears throat> And we note that David first appointed that thanksgivings be sung regularly. And it's not clear, but this probably before this was not a regular part of worship in the tabernacle that David was instituting this singing. Again, we saw Moses and the people sung. We see other times in the Old Testament where people sung, but that it was part of the regular daily worship it doesn't seem to be there. Um, at the end of First Chronicles, after this one example uh, psalm, we read, So David left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister regular, regularly before the Ark as each day required. And also Obed-Adam and his 68 brothers, while Obed-Adam, the son of Jeduthun, and Hosea were to be gatekeepers. And he left Zadok, the priest, and his brothers, the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord in the high place that was the high place I was at Gibeon, to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offerings regularly, morning and evening, to do all that is written in the law of the Lord that he commanded Israel. With them were Haman and Jeduthun and the rest of those chosen and expressly named to give thanks to the God for his steadfast love endures forever. Haman and Jeduthun had trumpets and cymbals for the music and instruments for sacred song. The sons of Jeduthun were appointed to the gate. Then all the people departed to his house, and David went home to bless his household. Again, certain men were chosen and named and appointed to be in charge of the responsibility to give thanks to the Lord with instruments and with song. That was their occupation. And again, uh, the temple was built under Solomon, and the singing of praise to God became part of regularly, regular daily worship um, in, in the temple. <clears throat> what we skipped over in 1 Chronicles 16 was what some people consider an example psalm or of the type of psalms that were to be sung. And um, again, the giving of thanks was preeminent 
and singing God's praises. Um, you may have noticed if you read also Psalm 105 that 1 Chronicles 16, 8 through 22 is Psalm 105, 1 through 15, or vice versa. That these hymns, these songs, were part of the worship of, of God, and that what we have in the Psalter is hymns that are ancient and have been used in the worship of God. Um, also in this psalm in First Chronicles um, is Psalm 96, which we reviewed um, two weeks ago as one of the restoration already psalms. And this is the amazing thing about these psalms is that these were being sung a thousand years before Jesus came. We see it in First Chronicles. And yet they apply to us at this time in our understanding this side of the cross about how the gospel is going out to all the world. So the Psalm in First Chronicles or 96 has these wonderful phrases, sing to the Lord, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. Um, for the, all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Verse 31, and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And then the, shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. There was a large vision going back to this time God was not a God of the Israelites only, but a God for, for all the nations. Uh, this you know, is remarkable. And we just see how in the history of redemption that Jesus just began that um, calling all the nations, um, Jew and Gentile alike, to be reconciled and restored to God. But that wasn't new with Jesus in any way, shape, or form. We see this even here in First Chronicles. This is what they were singing about way back then. Also, um, again, as we've said, that the Psalms, as we have them now, uh, show signs of what I will call holy editing. They are inspired scripture, but the way they might have been originally written might be a little bit different. In that Psalm uh, in First Chronicles, uh, verses 34 through 36, I'll give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God, of our salvation and gather and deliver us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. That ends the quote. Then all the people said, Amen, and praised the Lord. Whereas in Psalm 106, which echoes uh, most of this, and of course, that phrase, for his head, steadfast love endures forever, is repeated again and again in the Psalms. And in Psalm 136, it comes after every kind of, there's a phrase, and then for his steadfast love endures forever. But in Psalm 106, it ends in verse 48. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. So an example, this is text uh, in First Chronicles. It became part of the psalm in, um, when it was put into the Psalter in Psalm 106. All right, <clears throat> so we saw a thousand years before um, Jesus came, these psalms being part of the worship of God's people in the temple in Jerusalem. But what about uh, psalms and synagogue worship in Jesus' day? Um, we call that the second temple, of course. It was destroyed when Jerusalem was destroyed and its people captive. In Babylon, they went back, they restored the temple, uh, the temple, and they 
set up the worship of God again, including the use of psalms in worship. Um, I'm taking a lot of these ideas and organization from a little article, Psalms in Worship Throughout the Centuries, that was at, at this website. But <clears throat> in that article, um, it talks about um, in Jesus' day, the way psalms were used in temple worship is that uh, they were sung and they had to be sung by at least 12 voices of the Levites and following the morning sacrifice. Um, and from Sunday to Saturday, the Psalms were 24, 48, 82, 94, 81, 93, 92. So they had a weekly cycle of singing the Psalms. And if you were to look up Psalm 92, you'll note that the inscription says a Psalm for the Sabbath. So these Psalms were sung regularly as part of the temple worship after the morning sacrifice. Now, synagogues also arose after the temple was destroyed and the people um, worshiped or found a way to worship God in their captivity in the exile in Babylon. That coming together in a synagogue um, seems to have developed during that time, but it still continued even after the second temple was built um, so that uh, when Jesus and Paul, there are many examples of them teaching in synagogues, even though the temple was there. In synagogue worship, um, the people focused on uh, reciting prayers together, uh, listening to scripture readings, and there is evidence of regular use of psalms. Um, in synagogue worship at Jesus' time, especially what are known as the uh, Hallelujah Psalms, the final five Psalms, uh, 145 to 150. And the idea was that since Psalms were being sung at the temple, they were reflecting the temple worship by singing Psalms um, in the synagogue worship that took place on the Sabbath. There's a lot of uh, <clears throat> evidence that the New Testament uh, house churches uh, had songs and hymns and spiritual songs in at least four passages. In 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul writes, what then brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. Ephesians 5, we read this before, um, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Colossians 3, 16, we saw that before, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And James 5, 13, is anyone among you suffering? Let him play. pray. If any, is anyone cheerful, let him sing praise. Again, the combination of the emotions of giving back to God our thankfulness and the joy for his blessing is combined with singing his praise. Well, <clears throat> through the ages, uh, in early Christian and monastic uh, corporate worship, there is a lot of evidence that uh, beginning before the fourth fourth century, uh, the church in Rome allowed nothing but psalms and New Testament hymns, for example, the Song of Mary, the Song of Zechariah, to be sung at public worship. So new hymns were not being written. They went back um, to the psalms, and that was what was used in corporate worship. <clears throat> Um, during these days and, and up to the medieval period. Um, this article notes um, about the uh, worship in monasteries, their corporate worship um, became centered around the Psalms and remains um, the core of the monastic practice of cor corporate worship. And 
from about 600 AD until the 1960s and many of our lifetimes, uh, communities of monks and nuns in the Roman Catholic Church went through the Psalter in one week, all 150 Psalms in one week, uh, gathering eight times a day to pray. And this was called uh, keeping the hours, the liturgy of the hours. In the early 1960s, there was a lot of reform in the Roman Catholic Church called Vatican II. And they changed this to allow going through the Psalter in one month rather than one week, and then requiring uh, people in the monastic, living under monastic rules, um, fewer times to come together and pray daily. And in all these centuries, uh, the Psalms would either be recited together or chanted together. And perhaps you've heard of Gregorian chants that was named after Pope Gregory who lived um, 540-604, so a very, very ancient tradition. And so um, Psalms continued to play a major role in corporate worship outside the monastic life. And even Protestant churches with a liturgical tradition have calendars that guide morning and evening prayers and the use of Psalms. And such as the cathedral Psalm reading schedule I shared with you from the Episcopal Book of Common Prayer. And that slowed the tempo down you know, even more to about 40, uh, 49 days. Um, I can't imagine having to go through all the Psalms in one week. Well, what about after the Protestant Revelation, at least in the English speaking church? Um, <clears throat> I think this is interesting because it continues to live on in our tradition at Walls today. So I'll take a moment to mention this. Um, there is a movement um, in the English church to produce what are called metrical psalters so that the congregation could sing psalms together using a limited number of standard tunes. Again, with the Protestant uh, Reformation, the idea was to get everyone involved in worship. Worship was to be of uh, the ordained clergy and the lay people alike. So one way of doing this was to produce uh, metrical psalms. That meant the psalm was translated into words and syllables that could fit common musical patterns. So I'm going to present here two versions of Psalm 23 that are in what's called a common meter. And that just means uh, the um, number of syllables in a line. And these uh, two psalms could be sung to any tune that was also common meter. For example, our God, our help in ages past, amazing grace, or while shepherds watch their flock by flocks by night. And there's two types of versions here. One is like a non-rhyming version. And um, I've come across several times that the first book published in colonial America in Boston was the Bay Psalm book. That was all 150 Psalms in meter so that people would use that as their hymn books in um, church, in worship, and e everybody could sing together. So let me try to illustrate using the tune, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past. Um, our, our God, our help in ages past. So if you look on the left, the non-rhyming from the Bay Psalm book, the Lord to me a shepherd is want, therefore I shall not. He in the folds of tender grass doth cause me down to lie. Now you say, oh, wow, that's a long time ago, but actually, in the Trinity hymnal that we have at Wallace, the red hymnal, hymns 85, 86, 87 are the exact same words of a metrical psalm of Psalm 23, which was written in 1650. This, though, pays attention to rhyming. So let me try again with this version on the right. The Lord's my shepherd. 
Lord I'll not want, he makes me down to lie. In pastures green he leadeth me the quiet waters by. You know what? You can do this to amazing grace. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, he makes me down to lie. So this was very important, especially in Presbyterianism, and there's a lot of metrical psalms still in the Trinity hymnal. We also have poetical paraphrases of psalms. Isaac Watts, in the English language, published in 1719 his Psalms of David, which appears to, he appears to be the first one who paraphrased all the psalms for singing rather than translating them in English. And Our God, Our Help in Ages Past is a paraphrase of Psalm 90. But I want to note that the famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther, is his paraphrase of Psalm 46, some 200 years even before Isaac Watts. These German hymns did not become uh, part of, a, of English hymnody until later um, in the 1800s, um, but, but Luther was already paraphrasing that. But we see here, um, Psalm 90, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Um, Isaac Watts wrote that as our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. Or even more clearly, verse two, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In the hymn, before the hills in order stood, or earth received her frame, from everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. So that brings us to the use of Psalms in, wor in worship at Wallace Presbyterian today. Now, as a Presbyterian church, we hold to the regulative principle of worship. We desire to in use in worship only what has been clearly commanded in scripture. And thus, the singing of hymns of, based on the Psalms or the Psalms has traditionally been very strong. And there are some Presbyterian groups that insist on only singing from the Book of Songs in worship. Their idea is that, well, if God has given us an inspired hymn book, we should be using it in our worship of him and only him, God's given it to us. And Wallace was originally founded as a psalm singing church over a hundred years ago. In the history of Wallace that came out several years ago when we celebrate a hundred years, there's a copy of the advertisement that was in the newspaper and it said, people interested in forming a psalm singing church, which was meant a Presbyterian church. Because in the 1800s and 1900s, um, kind of gospel and devotional hymns had become more popular in evangelical churches than the psalm singing. It began to die out in America. But what do we see at Wallace today? The call to worship at the very beginning is most often from the psalms. And at least pre-COVID, it was most frequently with verses read alternately by the worship leader and then the congregation. And I believe today we have a psalm opening in the call to worship, but it's not being going to be read alternatively. Um, again, many of the hymns in the Trinity hymnal are based on the psalms, uh, either rhyming or non-rhyming um, metrical versions, or, or there's paraphrases. And just a note, something I found out in my exploration, the Trinity hymnal that we used, 1990, was jointly published by our denomination and the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. However, this hymnal has been revised in 2018 and published by the Orthodox Presbyterian Church and the United Reformed Churches in North America. And they're calling it the Trinity Psalmer, Psalter Hymnal. And in that hymnal, hymns one through 50 all correspond to the psalm of that number. And so if there's three versions of Psalm 23, they're numbered in that hymnal 23A, 23B, and 23C. And there is at least one song in that hymnal 
based on all 150 psalms in the Psalter. After Psalm, beginning with Psalm, uh, hymn 151, are psalms like we would, uh, hymns that like we would find in our hymnal. We often sing newer songs based on psalms, uh, and we'll see that today in our worship. One of the new songs is based on a psalm. And I noticed um, that under our former pastor Scott Bridges in his last years at Wallace, that at least one hymn during morning worship was a version of a song. Um, and the way I noticed that is sometimes I said, hey, this hymn doesn't seem to go with the theme of the worship, but it was, it was a song. So the evidence is very strong that psalms, especially the praise psalms, have been used for millennia by God's people and their worship of God and a practice greatly influenced by that great psalm writer, King David himself. Um, two, because of their personal connection as prayers on the one hand, and because of their connection to the complete history of redemption as we've seen in this course in the other, in corporate worship, Christian churches have traditionally placed a strong and at times exclusive emphasis on the use of Psalms because they are scripture, breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, says 2 Timothy 3.16. The Psalms are scripture. Um, this use of the Psalms goes beyond using only praise Psalms, and this usage was seen both as appropriate for worship and as we see for the monks and the nuns throughout the centuries, as part of their spiritual discipline, their spiritual formation. And the third and final point, while there are many views on the role and use of music and worship in the church today, and I'm no expert here, our Presbyterian roots at Wallace mean that the Psalms continue to play an important role in our corporate worship. So with that, just um, for next week, we'll be going to talk about the Psalms in personal worship. And the only Psalm to read is uh, Psalm 23. I think that's accessible to all of us. If you'd like, you can think about these two collections of Psalms in our Psalter, that these were like mini hymn books that I've been, been inserted, Psalms 120, 134, the Psalms of Ascent, and I'll talk about them in a little bit next week. Also, the Hallelujah finale, uh, these all songs of praise. So with that, I'm going to um, stop my share. And I think everybody is probably rushing off wanting to get to, to worship. But let me close this real quick in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you have given us in your holy word. And especially for the book of Psalms. For many people, that was their Bible, um, especially in early printing, and that was all that they could afford. Thank you that the whole history of redemption is reflected in these marvelous uh, uh, collection of hymns. And we just thank you, Lord, for the role that they have played in allowing us to worship together with the common prayers, with common um, uh, words that we can use together as your people to worship you. And even as we go into worship now, we ask that you would bless um, our worship of you, that be appropriate and by your Holy Spirit, that we would be fed um, by the preaching of your word, by participation in the sacraments, and by all that transpires this day. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.